Well, grace and mercy, peace to you from God our Father, and also on this Good Friday from our crucified Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text for this middle segment of the Traore service this day comes from Psalm, chapter, Psalm 22, of verse 16. And there we simply read, they have pierced my hands and feet. And this is our text. In Christ the Crucified, my dear friends. A few years ago, during Holy Week, a piece appeared in the Washington Post entitled, Five Myths About the Cross. It was written by a theology professor from, of all places, the University of Notre Dame. Her name was Robin Jensen. Dr. Jensen's second myth of the cross was this, that Jesus was nailed to the cross. According to her article, he wasn't nailed to the cross, he was tied to the cross. And then Professor Jensen cited several physiological and historical reasons for her claim. And finally, she appealed to the Bible's own record of the crucifixion. She pointed out that none of the four evangelists ever said that there were nails driven into Jesus' hands and feet, which is true. They didn't say that. But apparently, the good professor must have missed Sunday school the day the Thomas story was taught. <laughs> or if she was there, she must have forgotten that Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of those nails, I will never believe. And apparently she also forgot about the time when Jesus urged all his disciples to see his hands and to see his feet, simply because he had scars in his hands and on his feet that were used, that came from his, his crucifixion from the nails that were used there. And then, of course, there is our text from Psalm 22, a prophecy that has the Messiah, or that has the Christ saying very plainly, they have pierced my hands and my feet, which regardless to claims to the contrary is just what happened on that day when Jesus was crucified. Nails were driven into his hands and into his feet. But the question I'd pose is this. Who or what fulfilled Psalm 22's prophecy? Who or what pierced Jesus' hands and feet? Well, obviously, an answer could be given that it was the nails. Nails were what pierced. Jesus' hands and feet. And certainly they did, but maybe that's a bit too simplistic. Maybe a better answer would be the soldiers. After all, somebody had to drive those nails into Jesus' hands and feet. So it could be argued that the soldiers were the ones who fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 22. But then the soldiers were only following orders. And the one who issued the orders to the soldiers was, as we know, Pontius Pilate. It would never have been up to a squad of Roman soldiers to decide that this person needs to be crucified and maybe that person needs to be spared. Their job, their duty even, was to carry out the orders that they were given. And yet Pontius Pilate also knew that Jesus was innocent. He desperately wanted Jesus to be released. In fact, he tried every ploy that he could think of to make that happen, but to no avail. An incredible amount of pressure, pressure of the kind that he could understand. Political pressure was brought to bear on him and that pressure led him to give the order that Jesus was to be crucified. Now, that doesn't excuse Pilate. It makes him, like the soldiers and like the nails, an instrument, 
On the one hand, they were the ones responsible for piercing Jesus' hands and feet. But really, there was something else that caused Jesus' hands and feet to be pierced. Well, it could be suggested that it was that misguided mob that, that cried out, crucify him. Or maybe Jesus' enemies, the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the Sanhedrin. No doubt they all had a part in Jesus' crucifixion and by their actions, any one of them could have been guilty of piercing Jesus' hands and feet. But what we need to realize this afternoon is that over above anything or anybody we have mentioned so far, when it comes to the question of what pierced Jesus, what pierced his hands, what pierced his feet, the real answer, the Bible's answer, God's answer is sin drove those nails into Jesus. Your sin, my sin, and the sin of the whole world. And the thing is, sin demands punishment. The divine decree is the soul that sins shall die. God's perfect justice and his untainted holiness demands that sin be punished. There's no way around it. But at the same time, while God is just and holy, he's also merciful and gracious. And it was God's merciful and gracious plan to let Jesus, his only begotten son, be punished in our place and to suffer the wages of sin so that we might be totally free from that dreadful fate. That was the sole reason Jesus came into this world. He lived to die, and he died so that we might live. But, now having said all of that, having said that it was sin, our sin, and the sin of the whole world that pierced Jesus and nailed him to the cross, what we need to realize is that while sin might have ultimately pierced Jesus, it wasn't what held him to the cross. What actually held Jesus to the cross was love. Once Jesus told his disciples, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And then, as you remember, while he was hanging on the cross, there were those who taunted him saying, let him come down now from the cross and then we'll believe in him. Of course, Jesus didn't. Not because he couldn't, but because he chose not to. See, he who could rightly say all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me could easily have removed the nails that pierced him, and held him to the cross, and come down. But Jesus was held to the cross that day at Calvary by something much stronger than nails. And again, that was love. Jesus loved us so deeply and so powerfully that he was willing to let his hands and feet be pierced by nails for us. His love was so great for us that he was willing to die for us so that even in death, we would have forgiveness of all of our sins so that we by his love might be made God's own beloved sons and daughters here in time and forever throughout all eternity. On November 10th, 1975, the Great Lakes freighter, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, sunk beneath the waves of Lake Superior in a terrible storm. And then in memory of that tragic event, Gordon Lightfoot wrote a ballad to immortalize the 29 men who went down with the ship. The song was appropriately titled The Wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald. Maybe you remember that song. And if you do, maybe you also remember the sad line in it that asked, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the hours to minutes? Well, maybe we can relate. Because when waves of fear sweep over us, 
when disappointment or guilt or doubt or problems or pains or even death itself turn the minutes to hours for us, we too may wonder where the love of God has gone. But dear friends in Christ, you know what? Good Friday gives us the answer as it reminds us that the love of God went all the way to the cross. And should for one reason or another our question ever be, Lord, do you really love me? From the cross, Jesus gives the time, timeless answer. I love you this much, he tells us, as he allows his hands and his feet to be pierced. And then he dies for you and for me. Amen. And now may the peace of God, that peace that surely does pass all understanding, may it guard and may it keep your heart and mind in faith and in Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>